no matter what your job was, they wanted nothing but perfection. We're ready for the Japanese. If they attacked us, this war isn't going to last long. But that didn't stay long with us. The ship was old. A lot of the ammunition no longer worked. When the Houston went into the Battle of Sunda Strait, there were 1,068 crew members on board. Following the battle and the sinking of the ship, only 368 men survived. He said, you are a disgrace because you have surrendered, but you have been defeated, and you are going to do what we say. He looked me in the eye and he said, I was born on American soil, and by God, I was going to die on American soil. The Cruiser Houston of Pride and Purpose, next. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the Hamill Foundation, supporting the USS Houston exhibition at the MD Anderson Library, University of Houston. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take a seat so we can begin our service here today. Good afternoon. As always, it's a pleasure to see y'all, and it's been an especially nice few days to see all the new faces, and we even have more new faces here at this memorial service. Please feel free, always, to leave a token of remembrance to your loved one here at the monument, because they may be halfway across the world, but they are with us here today. We are here to remember the men who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country when they perished in battle. It has been 65 years since that fateful night, but we have not forgotten. They gave up their tomorrow for our today. The Cruiser Houston had a really close relationship with the city of Houston. William Bernreeder, who was an assistant to Mayor Oscar Holcomb, led a drive to have a major naval ship named for the city of Houston. And he really motivated people to make it happen. He was kind of the father of the Houston. It was a real instance of uh, the city pulling together and um, having this accomplishment, and it was, uh, gave them a great sense of civic pride. The ship was launched on September 1st, 1929, and it was christened by Elizabeth Holcomb, who was the daughter of Mayor Oscar Holcomb. And because it was prohibition, the ship was christened with a bottle of water from the Houston Ship Channel instead of champagne. The six ships from her class, the Northampton-class ships, Three of them were built as squadron flagships, three of them were built as fleet flagships, which had extended accommodations. Probably the most interesting thing about the Houston prior to World War II is that it was President Franklin D. Roosevelt's favorite ship. He loved to go deep sea fishing, and he went on four tours with the Houston during his presidency. On the ship, there, there was an entertainment committee and there was always something going on. We had a beautiful band and we always had good music every day. You would go to the D-Dunk stand, that's where you could buy Coke and stuff. And for a nickel, we take our gallon jug and they would squirt in the Coke juice. And then we would go to the faucet and fill it up. We take our gallon of coke and go up and sit on our blanket and listen to the orchestra. The USS Houston was flagship of the Asiatic fleet prior to World War II, and it was out in the Philippines. There was a lot of activity in the Pacific at that time. They had a regular routine where they traveled from Manila 
up to Shanghai, then up to these northern, uh, the northern ports of China during the summer because it was cooler. In the winter months, they would come back down to Manila. Starting in 31, but really accelerated in 1937, there was a, a big acceleration of Japanese aggression starting at Shanghai, moving down the coast of China. Gradually, one after another, the Japanese were seizing these ports, and there was really nothing Western nations can do. Crew aboard the Houston were probably one of the best trained that the Navy had. We were out day after day, gunnery practice, this was endless. And they were experts in all of their jobs. And no matter what your job was, they wanted nothing but perfection. We're ready for the Japanese. If they attacked us, this war isn't gonna last long. But that didn't stay long with us. We found out later that it was a completely different story, that the Japanese were well prepared, much more than we were out there. Admiral Hart was convinced the Japanese were going to attack. And this was the end of November, the 1st of December, 1941. We went to Iloilo, which is approximately 250 miles south of Manila. The ship was in radio silence, and the uh, radioman would read several books a week in order to keep awake. And about this time, the dots and the dashes, da 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 and so forth. You copy it, and I threw it in the basket, and I wanted to get back to my book. And then I thought, what did that say? And we looked at it, and... Uh, it was an urgent message, and it simply stated, Japan has commenced hostilities, X. Govern yourselves accordingly. End of message. Our captain came on our PA system, and this was late at night, and informed us that, that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, and that we were in a state of war, and that we had to be aware from every moment there on that we were in a state of war and that we had to be ready for any eventuality. They were immediately put on alert and sent out to station in the Philippines. And that's when they became part of the ABDA fleet. And ABDA stands for Australian, British, Dutch, and American. And it was a cooperative fleet among these four allied nations. The, the Dutch were very concerned about, about defending their area, which was really the main objective of the Japanese, the ne Netherlands, East Indies. They needed the oil. That's why they moved south. They attacked the Philippines because the Philippines was on the flanks. They, they couldn't leave their flanks exposed. They had to attack the Philippines. But basically, they wanted to get down to Malaya and get to Sumatra. Uh, Java, Borneo, and Celebes uh, because of oil. The Houston was an older ship. Most of the ships in the ABDA fleet were older. They had really poor communication between them. It was four different nations, different languages, different ways of doing things, all trying to cooperate. This was an attempt at a combined or unified uh, command early in the war uh, against the Japanese. It was a pretty haphazard, pretty shaky organization. It generally was under British control, but uh, they put an American Admiral, Admiral Thomas C. Hart, who was the uh, commander-in-chief of the Asiatic Fleet, was in charge of the naval unit. The ship was old. A lot of the ammunition no longer worked. And these ships were sent out to try to protect the Dutch East Indies in the Pacific, and they were sent out against the Imperial Japanese Navy, which was modern, well-equipped, new ships, very well organized, and they were really sitting ducks. But we didn't know what to expect. We, we didn't realize then how powerful of a fleet the Japanese had built. We learned later that we didn't have a chance. Albert H. Rooks took over the ship in the summer of 1941 from Jesse B. Oldendorf. She was an intellectual type of officer, really. Once the war started, uh, and they saw his abilities as a ship handler, because he got them through 
a lot of very, very uh, dangerous situations. The men gained a lot of respect for him. The anti-aircraft ammunition for our eight five-inch guns, which was very important to fight the Japanese aircraft, was faulty to a great degree. We personally saw when we shot at planes that attacked us that these five-inch shells would go up but not explode. So the Japanese planes that were really bombing us flew right over, dropped their bombs, and kept right on going. A striking group was put together to, to move north and, and try and strike the Japanese invasion. But they did not get very far out into the Java Sea, and they were promptly attacked by high-level bombers. The first contact with the Japanese was with, was an air raid over us on February the 4th, 1942. They come over in waves of uh, groups of nine, three groups of three, in perfect formations. Captain Rooks would go and make these S's, sharp right and then sharp left, when these bombs were dropping. And you could see that the bombs, where they hit, Captain Rooks and uh, another officer, they had worked out a, uh, a procedure, you know, based on the speed of the ship, the wind velocity. When the bombers would release their bombs, they would watch them coming down. And at the appropriate time, he would give a hard port or a hard starboard, and the bombs would land right alongside the ship. This tremendous vibration every time they hit. It'll actually lift the ship out of the water. And you're, you're sitting there, you're helpless. There's nothing you can do. So those bombs, when they dropped close nearby, why well, the shrapnel, you could hear that hit or hear their shrapnel hitting the side of the ship like like you, like a popcorn popper, you know, you could peep, 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 peep. That was scary. Psychologically, the effect of a near miss is, is tremendous. These planes had made several runs over us, and every single one they dropped missed us. But the very last run, three planes came over. Three groups of bombs coming down, but one bomb just went astray and came right down into our turret. The raid we thought was over, and this one bomb came straggling down all by itself. It hit one of the yard arms on the aftermast, which is above turret three. Yeah, I think it got hung up in the in the bomb bay, and it managed to strike the ship at a very critical place, right behind turret three. Uh, it was the first time that the Houston had ever been hit. Now, Tokyo Rose had said in her radio uh, stories that the Houston had been sunk eight times prior to this day, and that's how they got the name Galvin Ghost of the Java Coast because they couldn't find her, and they kept saying that she was sunk, but then she wasn't. The explosion tore a big hole in the deck, main deck, and the shrapnel, shrapnel punctured the turrets, armor, and started a fire in the turret. I look, opened that little door up, and I said, hey, this guy looks like he's still alive. You stand there holding on that tray like that? And they said, well, get in and help him out. I went in and I said, come on, buddy, come on out of there. He grabbed him by the arm, and his mate just peeled off his arm. He was cooked, stand up there, just cooked alive. The shell hit between the aft part of the turret of three, killing all 44 people inside. Um, at that time, my father was around the hangar bay area, and he was heading back toward the turret three. He went in the turret, he went down, he helped remove wounded and secure the, the powder that was in the turret, which of course would have been disastrous. That would have ended the Houston right there and then. He noticed that the shells inside, it was so hot, flames were in there that the sh grease on the shells were starting to boil and it's what they call a cook-off and its shell would explode and then it would just been a chain reaction the magazine would have gone up uh, but he was able to uh, put these containers and bust it over the top of the shells which cooled 
the shells down so that they didn't cook off. Uh, he would come to the door and the smoke was bellowing out the door of the turf and the officer ordered him out and he refused and went back in and kept on till they could get a fire hose that charged up and get it to him. And then when he came out, they gave him fire hose. He basically cooled down and put out the fire in turf three. He was given a bronze star and then they upgraded it to a silver star. She had nine eight inch guns and she just lost three of them. She still had six. The ship structurally had not been harmed. One thing about the Asiatic fleet, it was old and small, but it was, uh, it was a bunch of tough guys and they weren't afraid of a fight by any stretch of the imagination. So they decided to, to, to keep her out there. Of course, they were very angry at this point. You know, they'd not really been able to strike back at the Japanese and seeing a bunch of their, their buddies killed and maimed, you know, they were, they were pretty infuriated. From my observation and from my experience, we underwent some very excellent training. Not only were we trained to use the equipment, we were trained to cooperate and get along together. I don't think there is a crew on any ship that got along any better than the crew uh, of the Houston. The Dutch weren't going to give up without a fight. They were going to fight to the bitter end. They were going to fight all their ships to the bitter end, and they did, basically lost virtually all of their ships. The British knew the, the jig was up when Singapore fell on February 15th, and they wanted to get their people out of there. After the Battle of the Java Sea, and, and when my ship and the Australian ship were the only ones left out of 12 ships, they sunk those 10 ships there in those two days, February 27 and 28. And in those two days, we were uh, fighting 100%. If we weren't actually firing, we were in the area. We just come from the Battle of the Java Sea, and uh, we were pretty tired people. It was a long battle overnight. Of course, we were tired and hungry. We didn't <laughs> eat too much either. But so we, we all uh, wanted to get some sleep, rest, but they decided uh, they needed more ammunition for turret tur one and two. They'd take the ammunition from turret three stories and move it up to turret one and two. So that took a lot of effort and manpower. And that night when they went into Sunday Straits, they only had approximately 40 regular rounds and 20 starburst shells to fight the battle. In the Battle of Sunda Strait, it was a, quite a different type of engagement. It took place in the middle of the night. Uh, it, it was a surprise engagement. The Houston and the Perth were basically trying just to, to escape the, the East Indies. They were leaving Batavia, which is Jakarta today, and steaming towards Sunda Strait. And purely by chance, happened to to steam into the middle of a, of a Japanese landing. The Dutch told us that the, the straits were clear. There were no Japanese for the next 200, 215, 50 miles. They noticed a strange patrol vessel in front of them and began signaling them in a manner they did not recognize. Perth was the ship in the lead because she had the senior officer present. That was the protocol. The commander of the Perth, he picked up one of the Fubuki type destroyers and he opened fire on it right away. That, that is what started. She immediately realized it was a Japanese vessel and Houston opened fire within a minute or so after, after that. All of a sudden, the whole area lit up in Starship. It was the whole Japanese fleet. And for that, almost a whole hour there, we were firing point blank. We could see sailors on the deck of these destroyers. We could see them manning their 50 caliber machine guns. I say 50 caliber, they looked just like ours. But we were so near that we were not firing over the horizon like you do in a major battle where the enemy is way out there. We were firing point blank on all these ships we were firing on. See, there was just uh, the Houston and the HMAS Perth, and the Japanese were firing so furiously, 
Shells were going every direction, and they sunk a lot of their own ships. Her lasted probably 30 or 40 minutes before she was hit by torpedoes. The Japanese fired an enormous number of torpedoes in the battle, I think 80 or 90. I was uh, in the uh, number one turret on the starboard side, and uh, they got a little, little bitty hole about that big, and it's just big enough for me to get into. And that was a powder box on the side of the turret. And they have two hatches that shut down like that. And when the, the elevator come up from down below with this big bag of gunpowder, it was about 24 inches long and eight inches in diameter. And the guy says, when that door there opens, you slide two bags of powder out there. When that door opens, you shoot one. Oh boy, <laughs> that was a thrill. You know, Luke, you kid me, like, you're just a young kid, you know, and everything. That thing, boom, like that, you just do everything and rattle, and you could hear stuff rattling all over. Two forward turrets fired during the battle, but the second one took a direct hit on its faceplate from a Japanese shell. It didn't penetrate it, but it broke it open. At that point, hot fragments from the shell entered the turret and set the turret on fire because there's powder in there and it went up like a blowtorch. This is a tur the turret that's closest to the bridge. Killed nearly everybody in there. There were a few survivors. The Japanese had illuminated it with searchlights, and the Houston, their turrets were either out of ammunition or unworkable, and they were firing everything they had at the Japanese. And we have what are known as star shells, which they use just for illumination. They were firing those, and then they had some people up in the machine gun nest, and they just continued to fire. The captain was right behind that turret in what was known as a conning tower. The conning tower was an armored enclosure from which you could fight a ship during a battle. But it was so, the fire was so intense, he had to abandon that, uh, at which point he came down out of the conning tower to what's known as communications deck. And he was at the back of the communications deck. At that point, they knew the ship was doomed. We were given one abandoned ship, and then they belayed this, which means they ignore it. And then, not very long, a couple of minutes later, we're given the second abandoned ship. And I had never done this before, but somebody motioned to me to follow him, and I went up the leg of the mast, and I got off at the same deck the captain was on. He was killed at this point, and I picked up a lot of the shrapnel that hit him. The Japanese fired the star shells and illuminated the whole sky, and they kept it that way for the entire time until we were sunk. And when we abandoned ship, we could look back at our ship and see it clearly. Even though it was burning, it was in clear view, and we could see a Japanese destroyer nearby. And this was soon after midnight, and I remember it wasn't long, we were looking at the ship. I, I personally saw the ship, my bow first, go under. Now, the Japanese destroyers were still firing all around in the water. You could feel it, you could feel that concussion in your guts with the shells going in the water. I would submerge and I'd stay down as long as I possibly could and then I'd come up and then on one of these occasions I came up and it was total blackness, there was nothing. The Japanese were gone, the Houston was gone, there was nothing. Just a mountain top off in the distance. When the Houston went into the Battle of Sunda Strait, there were 1,068 crew members on board and following the battle and the sinking of the ship, only 368 men survived. The battle itself is more in line with something that a Texan would appreciate because we love the Alamo and we love lost causes and we love last stands. And it's very much in that vein. I think a person should see the sacrifice of the Asiatic fleet as a whole in, in that light. And in that sense, the Houston could be seen as emblematic of the sacrifice of the entire Asiatic fleet. The survivors of the sinking of the ship made their way to land. They 
made this incredible swim. Many of them were burned by oil from the ship. There were Japanese snipers shooting at them in the water, um, but uh, they managed to make it to land. Then while they were on shore, they lined them all up on the beach behind a jeep that had a machine gun. And my dad told me that he told one of, I don't know who he was with, but he said if they pull the hammer back, he's gone. They're gonna take off running. And just as he started to reach for the hammer, a Japanese officer came and told him, no, 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 don't, don't kill him. And they used them to unload the ships there was only 368 of them that made it to shore. And the first place they were sent, they were forcibly marched to the town of Sarang, and there they were put into a movie theater. And the conditions were very poor. They weren't given any medical treatment. They had blistered feet from walking, and when they had walked, they had been forced to pull these little pony carts full of supplies. And we were all laying down in that cement floor like sardines side by side, you know, just very crowded. You couldn't, you couldn't roll over or anything. You know, if you got up to go to the latrine, you know, you'd, you'd lose your place. You'd have to try to squeeze back. <laughs> it's very difficult. We were in Sarang for many weeks. There were no seats. We had to sit cross-legged on the floor and then the Japanese were, uh, they'd, in the, the balconies, they'd sit there with their machine guns on us. We got practically nothing. I remember at first, we waited for hours and hours, and we finally got some water. The water was boiling, and you'd drink it because you were so thirsty. We probably stuck to high heaven in that theater, all those men in there, and that. Uh, Japanese decided they couldn't stand the smell anymore, so they decided to take us to the little river that runs through town. So we gladly went to the river, and uh, I decided to s swim towards the midstream. I thought maybe it'd be better water out there, because everybody's washing their clothes on the other, s other side of the river. But what I found was a lot of uh, human refuge, feces running down the middle of the river. They use it for their sewage disposal also, you see. At one point, my leg, my left leg had, uh, had swollen. It was very, it was about the size of a basketball. And a couple of Aussies uh, picked me up and took me uh, to the rear of the theater and the, the doctor from the HMAS Perth had set his offices up there. And he uh, lanced my leg with, he had a razor blade, which he had put on a piece of wood. After spending some time in Sarang, they went to their next place of incarceration, which was known as Bicycle Camp. And Bicycle Camp was in Batavia, and it had been the former home of a bicycle battalion, of the Dutch army. So bicycle camp, compared to other places where the survivors stayed during the war, was not too bad. And some of them guys were laying there, you know, head naked. They didn't have no clothes at all. Like guys give me a khaki uniform. and I had, I had little feet, so I was doing pretty good because I, I had shoes. I was asked once if I would uh, uh, care for some rabbit. At, and uh, I hadn't seen meat, you know, and months. Of course, I was all for it. So I had a drumstick, and then I was told it was cat. They had, I think the prisoners had eaten every cat on the island there. There were no cats left. 